Hello and welcome. In this video, I will be talking about the history of Mad Max video games and what the 2015 Mad Max game really is. Let's begin. Let's start at the very end, the end credits of the 2015 Mad Max video game. There's a certain name missing from those credits, do you know what it is? Let me tell you, that name is George Miller. Yes, the creator of Mad Max himself is not even mentioned once in that video game. Why is that? To answer this question we'll have to look back at the troubled history of not one, not two, not three, but four cancelled Mad Max video games and only two official games that came out all over the course of 30 years. This is going to be a long journey, so strap yourselves in and let's go. Believe it or not, but the very first Mad Max video game was supposed to be released in 1987, just two years after the release of Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome. The Mad Max craze was still going strong, and George Miller was interested in new technologies that would allow him to tell stories in completely new ways. The company Hasbro would give him that opportunity with a prototype console called Project Nemo. This console was quite unusual. It used VHS tapes to store data, which meant that games would have full motion video with 8-bit overlay graphics. Ken Melville, who developed this console, was a big fan of Mad Max. So he decided to create a crude live action full motion video to demonstrate how a driving game would look like on the system. He filmed all the footage on his ranch in Agua Dolce using a Toyota Tacoma with a 16mm camera strapped on the back and then he went on to match the footage to make it work on the Nemo prototype console. He showed this demo to George Miller and George really loved it. He even said that Mel Gibson would love to be part of that game, so he hooked Melville up with Ed Verraw, Beyond Thunderdome's concept and storyboard artist, to create the very first Mad Max game. Melville would produce the game, George Miller would direct it, and the entire thing would be a Kennedy Miller production for Hasbro. The game was going to be called Mad Max Autorama. The production had begun and everyone was excited. While Melville was developing the script trying to figure out split points for each interactive video sequence, Ed Verraw was storyboarding the entire game in color. George Miller's excitement grew each time he received new material, however, the project was just not meant to last. Turns out that Hasbro thought Mad Max was aimed at children. I mean, needless to say, they were shocked when they saw the level of violence in Mad Max Autorama. Once they realized what the Mad Max series really is, they immediately shut the whole project down. This was the first out of four cancelled Mad Max games, but this failure did not discourage Miller from trying again. Just three years later, in 1990, the hype around Mad Max started to fade. Without any new Mad Max movies on the horizon, it seemed only logical to turn Mad Max into a video game. But unfortunately, the movie license was given to the wrong people. Warner Brothers sold the Mad Max license to Mindscape, a developer studio that was notorious for buying cheap official licenses and creating very mediocre games just to cash in on name recognition. To give you an example of how bad it was, Mindscape created a game called The Last Starfighter, except it was just a port of the Commodore 64 game called Iridium, with The Last Starfighter license slapped on it. They simply changed the sprites, but the game had nothing to do with the movie. The fate of the NES Mad Max game was not going to be any better. Meet Christopher Pico, who is a fan of Mad Max movies, and who also beta tested this game for Mindscape for about a month when he was a kid. Here are his impressions of the beta version of the game. I'm a huge fan of this trilogy of movies at that point, and I hated the game, and I told them so. I gave it to them right to their face. I told them that I thought the graphics were shit. They were lazy programmers because they just kept repeating the same uh, 
levels just with different colors palettes swapped out the controls were some of the worst i'd ever i'd ever played the difficulty was just up there what you needed to do in the game to progress was so vague the instructions didn't even really tell you what you needed to do the thing that really really pissed me off the most was that they didn't even use the license properly i'm like if you're gonna pay the money for mad max and put fucking mel gibson on the cover you know at least use the the property. The only thing that reminded me of the movie was the opening title scroll, which tells you like the story from Road Warrior. I was like, why would you put the Ringmaster guy from Beyond Thunderdome? You know the dying times here. Why would you put him in the game if you're not gonna have anything from Beyond Thunderdome in the game outside of him? I was mad. I was like, you know, you took one of my favorite series of films and just made like this generic game out of it. Unfortunately, the finished game was no different from the beta. It was just as mediocre, vague, and disjointed as before. It was pretty obvious at that point that the official license was only used to trick people into buying this game. Needless to say, George Miller was very disappointed. After all, this was the very first ever official Mad Max game, and it was a disaster. Meanwhile, Mindscape being, you know, Mindscape, they just didn't care. They still had the license, so they started working on a sequel to the Mad Max on NES. The sequel was virtually finished, but Warner Brothers took away the license from them just in time. Of course, that did not stop Mindscape from releasing that game, only under a different name and with all the license material removed from it. They called this game Outlander, and they released it on Sega Genesis and Super Nintendo in 1992. The failure of the very first officially released Mad Max game is extremely significant, because it made George Miller very protective of the Mad Max franchise. Miller would simply lock away the license and not allow any game studio to create a Mad Max game. Of course, that didn't stop game developers from trying, so let's have a look at the second Mad Max game that was being developed, but never came out. Acquiring a license for a Mad Max game became so difficult that it became something of a legend in the video game industry. A legendary task that some developers would tackle head-on. Developers such as the Australian-based Melbourne House Studio. Melbourne House was a prolific game developer in the 80s, but by the late 90s their studio was on the brink of closing. In 1999, Bruno Bonnell, the CEO of Infogrames, saved Melbourne House only for one good reason. To create a Mad Max game. Why? Because they're Australian, and they had already created a racing game called Death Cars. Immediately, everyone at Melbourne House dropped what they were doing and went to work on a Mad Max game. There was one problem though, they did not have the license. But that didn't discourage the new owner at all, in fact he ordered to create the game anyway hoping that the final product would be so good that it would convince George Miller to give them the license. The game was going to be called Mad Max Asylum. It was going to be set years after Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome. Max was once again a broken man with nothing left and nothing to live for. He would then rescue a young girl who was roughly the same age as his son who was killed in the original Mad Max. And she also had the same name as Max's wife, Jessie. This was enough for Max to start caring for the little girl. In this game, Max would visit familiar places from the movies. He would also have his dog, another blue healer, that would react when Max was talking to someone. The main villain would be a cannibal with a catchphrase Time to eat. The game also had a few high concepts. One of them would be about Max stumbling upon a kilometer high oil rig in the middle of the desert, which would make Max realize that he was in fact traveling through a dried up ocean. And of course the game would have the iconic interceptor in it as well. As you can see, some of those concepts sound familiar if you've watched Fury Road and played the 2015 Mad Max game, but we'll get to that in a minute. Eventually, a meeting with George Miller was secured. He was very interested and responsive to the pitch, and there was also this distinct feeling that Miller had already done his research on video games prior to meeting with developers. After the meeting, the spirits were high and everyone was awaiting Miller's decision, but unfortunately, the game was not given the green light effectively making it the second cancelled Mad Max video game. I haven't found any official reasons why this game was really cancelled, so I did a little bit of research myself. After talking with people involved in the production of Fury Road, it was revealed to me that Mad Max Asylum was 
just accidentally too similar to Fury Road. For example, the character of a fat cannibal was very oddly similar to the people eater from the movie, but that was just a complete coincidence. The idea of a girl saved by Max was also too similar to the story of, well, the girl that was saved by Max before Fury Road. It would create a lot of confusion if the game was released along with the movie back then, so Miller simply decided against it. However, the similarities between this game and Fury Road were not the only reason why this game was canned. Remember how I said that Miller seemed oddly familiar with video games when Melbourne House gave him a visit? Well, that is because he was already working on his own Fury Road tie-in video game at that time. And this is how it went. One day in the late 1990s, George Miller shared a flight with Brian Fargo, the founder of Interplay who created the Fallout games. Fargo was obviously a great fan of Mad Max, and you would definitely know this if you played Fallout games, but it turned out that Miller was also a big fan of Fallout. So they started talking and eventually they decided that they should work on a Mad Max game together. They set up a meeting in Australia where Fargo got himself familiar with the script to Fury Road, which inspired the early stages of development for the game. It was going to be a party-based RPG, combining the style of the developer's earlier games with Miller's unique vision. The vehicles would obviously be worked in as well. Unfortunately, out of the blue, a new player had entered the game. EA offered $20 million to buy the game license right on the spot, and George Miller obliged, leaving Interplay high and dry. Since EA got the license, we never really heard about any progress on their Mad Max game. And you know what? I think that's actually a good thing that they never made it. I don't like EA. <laughs> what can I say? And the game award goes to... Oh man, I have to pay a microtransaction to unlock? That's so... stupid. And they probably wouldn't have made it anyway, because Fury Road fell over soon after in 2003 and was indefinitely postponed thus spurring a chance for a Mad Max game for the third time. From 2003 to 2009, the world of Fury Road grew way beyond the movie itself, and Miller was just ready to shoot the movie in Australia. Backstories for everything were written, for each character, vehicle and weapons, oh, they all had their own stories to tell. In 2008, George Miller had so much material to go with the movie that he wanted to hit us hard with as much Mad Max as humanly possible. Suddenly, Fury Road turned into a three-headed beast, consisting of Mad Max, Fury Road, the live-action movie, Furiosa, a 3D CGI anime, and the new Mad Max tie-in video game, all of which shared the same world and were deeply interconnected on the story level. The game was going to be written by George Miller and Corey Barlog, the director of God of War 2. Barlog finished conceptualizing the game with Miller in 2008, and immediately wrote on his personal blog that, and I quote, I gotta say, and I know I'm totally biased here, but I gotta say that this story, as well as this game, is pretty badass. The game was going to be very closely tied in with the movie. And it's something you'd probably never guess, but traces of that unreleased game are still in the movie. If you look at the Interceptor in Fury Road, you'll notice that it doesn't have the rear spoiler. That is because this spoiler was supposed to be a collectible item in that video game. Cameron Manuel, who built the Interceptors for the movie, told me that he was specifically asked to remove a part of the iconic Interceptor so that it would be later found as an item in that video game. So, if you've ever wondered why there is no spoiler on the Interceptor in Fury Road, that's your answer. So, clearly, the video game had elements of car building, and also was going to have melee and ranged weapons, as well as vehicular combat. Cory Barlog was excited for the game, and he was already looking for a publisher in 2008. But, unfortunately, Mother Nature had other plans. Fury Road fell over for the second time in 2010, when the shooting location of Broken Hill in Australia was flooded with massive rains and turned the Australian Red Desert into a flower garden. At that point, Warner Brothers, the film studio that partially owned rights to Mad Max and financed the whole thing, they got really frustrated because they've sunk so much money into Fury Road at that point 
that the sheer thought of moving the film to Namibia just gave them multiple aneurysms. And that is where things really fell off the wagon for Miller's and Barlock's game. Things that will make you understand why the 2015 Mad Max game is just so strange. Immediately after the rains in Broken Hill, Warner Brothers sidelined George Miller and stopped him from having any input into the Mad Max game project. Miller was only supposed to focus on filming Fury Road, and that's it. The game was now going to be developed in Sweden by Avalanche Studios. Interestingly, Corey Barlog, who worked with Miller on the game, went on to work at Avalanche Studios in 2010, which would seem like a ray of hope that maybe he would bring Miller's game along with him to Avalanche Studios. But nope, turns out that he only worked there as a consultant. Corey had later put out a statement saying that he most definitely did not bring Miller's game to Avalanche, while Avalanche's CEO, Christopher Sundberg, said that Corey Barlog wasn't even working on a Mad Max game at Avalanche at all. This means only one thing. Warner Brothers and Avalanche were working together on their own version of a Mad Max game, and they had pushed everyone away who was involved in Miller's original vision. Just a year later, in 2011, George Miller acquired whatever was left of Team Bondi, an Australian game developer that created L.A. Noir. That was Miller's attempt to bring back the game to Australia and develop it at his own digital media company called Dr. D Studios. Unfortunately, that plan had failed. Corey Barlog left Avalanche Studios in January 2012, and with his departure, Warner Brothers have effectively cancelled a fourth Mad Max game. Warner Brothers were now free to create whatever Mad Max game they wanted. Because they shared rights to the Mad Max franchise, they had access to 15 years of Fury Road concept art, stories developed by Miller and his writers, and tons of material that they could pick and choose from without ever consulting the man who created it. When I talked to certain key figures responsible for creating Fury Road, they told me that they had no idea what Warner Brothers and Avalanche were up to. When I explained the plot of the game to them, because believe it or not, but some of them have not even played that game, they straight up told me that this game is definitely not canon. That it just looks like a collection of ideas developed for Fury Road over the years, but with their own twist. And I'm pretty sure that ideas from previous cancelled Mad Max games are in this game as well, but that is not the most important thing. The most important thing is that George Miller did not control what Warner Brothers were putting in this game. And in result, this game contains spoilers from future Mad Max movies. And no, I'm not going to tell you what those things are. But I can tell you how I know this. You see, I know just a little bit about the scripts for future Mad Max sequels. Not a whole lot, just very little. But the things that I already know have showed up in that game. On top of it all, Warner Brothers had a very, let's say, corporate plan for the game. After all, they're a company, so their top priority is to sell a product. So the plan was to make this as the most generic Mad Max game possible, because that way it would just sell more copies. Now, let's have a look in detail at some of the things that Warner Brothers did with this game. When the first version of the game was shown to the public, everyone noticed that something was off. Max was suddenly speaking with an American accent. Out here, a man is nothing without his ride. And everyone knows that Max is an Australian icon, so turning Max into an American was met with a lot of outrage from fans of the franchise. Especially if you look at the history of the very first Mad Max movie that was also dubbed into American English for its release in the United States. And here I am, trying to put sense to it. Here I am, trying to put sense to it. When I know there isn't any. The reason for the American dub of Mad Max 1 was purely financial, and just as it was for the video game. It's funny how history repeats itself, huh? For the video game, however, the outrage was so big that Avalanche Studios decided to turn Max back into an Australian. It was a small victory, but in the grand scheme of things, it didn't change a whole lot. The game was still going to be pretty generic, and sometimes with changes in it that were just completely inexplicable. For example, let's have a look at Max's backstory. For whatever reason, Max in the game had a daughter, when in the movies, he had a son. Now, I really don't know why they would change such a thing, and it's not because I'm a big fan of Mad Max, but because this change just doesn't do anything for the story of the game. 
So I guess they did it because they could, or maybe they didn't bother to check? I don't know. This approach to make the game generic was also reflected in the setting of the game, which doesn't look very Australian at all. Mind you, I'm not talking about the bottom of the sea that you're driving on half of the game, but if you look at the rest of the map, most of it just doesn't look Australian. In fact, a lot of the regions of the map look American with canyons and wide empty highways. The rest looks nondescript and there's only one area with red dirt that kind of looks like Australia. Now let's have a look at the central story of the game. The plot of Glory and her mother was simply lifted from Miller's notebook and it was modified for the game. You can find the full and official version of that story in the Mad Max number no. 1 and number no. 2 comic books released by Vertigo. But for now, I'll briefly explain the differences between the video game version and the official version that's in the comic books. In the game, Max loses to Scrotus and is saved by Hope. In the comic book, Max is attacked by the Buzzards and is saved by Glory's mother, who does not have a name. In the game, Max goes to the buried airport to save Glory from the Buzzards. In the comic book, Max goes to the sunken city to save Glory from the Buzzards but mostly just to get his car back from the buzzards. Finally, Glory and Hope are killed by Scrotus in a pretty gruesome way. In the comic book, Glory and her mother are ran over by the buzzards. I think it's pretty clear by now that Warner Brothers just took that story, modified it and wrote the whole game around it. Now let's have a look at the cars from the game because we might learn something pretty interesting. You see, most of the cars in this game are based on Fury Road cars, but from around 2010. That is before they were shipped to Namibia, where they were modified even further. That year, 2010, is when Warner Brothers took the game from Miller, along with Fury Road assets. Which explains why the cars in the game look like old versions of Fury Road cars and have not been updated. Even the war rig in the game is based on an early version which was built in 2009 with a Datsun on a tanker uh, which was later replaced. This sort of approach isn't limited to cars though. Warner Brothers used early designs and concept art from Fury Road all over in the game. For example, some locations look like they've been lifted from very early Fury Road storyboards. The buzzards jump out from the ground, just like in the early Fury Road storyboards and concept art. Another example is the character of Blastcap, who is based on Fury Road concept art that was developed in 2009 by Weta, a design studio from New Zealand. Weta were briefly hired to create concept art for Fury Road because George Miller was fascinated by their work and wanted to see what they could come up with. Thankfully, only a tiny portion of their designs were used because... What the hell? Interestingly, one of their Nux car designs created by Aaron Beck from Weta actually ended up in another game, Need for Speed 2015. That car is the Beck Customs F132, so I guess you can say that Need for Speed has a little bit of Fury Road in it now. And while we're on the subject of Weta, Miller created Dr. D Studios as Australia's answer to Weta. And what does that have to do with the Mad Max game at all? Well... Came the property of Dr. D when that time came. After many battles, Dr. D's hordes were bested. Now, I'm only scratching the surface, showing you the things that Warner Brothers took from early stages of Fury Road's production. The game is literally filled to the brim with them. Locations, characters, weapon designs. And, you know, that is not to say that Avalanche did not come up with anything. I mean, it's their game, they developed it, They're, it's full of Avalanche's ideas. However, because of Warner Brothers' reckless approach towards this game, there are some things in it that I don't think they should be there. And that is why I find this game so fascinating. In a way, it gives you a look behind the scenes of Fury Road and also its future. Now, I fully understand that because this game is such a mishmash of ideas, that it could be simply explained, you know, in the standard Mad Max fashion. That, you know, it's just another Mad Max myth. That it doesn't have to make sense. But to me, this sort of explanation has always been a cheap cop-out. And that is because, if you look deep enough, you'll find reasons as to why things are the way they are. And I really hope that I got you familiar with those reasons. And even if you don't believe me, just remember that Miller did not want to create a vague Mad Max game with Max as an American. Instead, he really wanted a true Mad Max Fury Road tie-in video game. That was always the plan. But instead, 
This is the second official Mad Max game that we ever got, and again, it's just something that doesn't have Miller's stamp of approval. He's not even credited in this. For that, this game exists completely as its own thing. You can forget about trying to put it anywhere on the timeline. But you can definitely use it as a study of what Fury Road could have looked like at some point, or have a peek at some backstories that Miller developed, or see some ideas that were running for decades in the production pipeline. I mean, it's all there. Now, before I end this video, let's just make something clear. I am not saying that this game is bad. It is not. It is a very solid and a fun game. I must have for every Mad Max fan, regardless. It's just that the story of how this game came about is quite revealing. And I think it might help you understand why we never had many Mad Max games to begin with, for example. Or why Miller grew so protective of the franchise. Or maybe even why Miller just recently sued Warner Brothers. Whatever the case, I really hope that one day we're going to get a true Mad Max game with Miller behind the wheel, as it should be because this franchise most definitely deserves it. Just as Miller deserves to have his name in the credits. Thank you very much for watching this video. If you liked it, please leave a like and a comment and subscribe for more. I'll see you in the next video. Until then, stay shiny and chrome.